Hi guys, how are things? Uh, thanks for joining so early. Uh, I am waiting uh, for Larissa. Here's Larissa now, I think. Uh, let me see. Uh, yeah, Larissa is just about to jump in. So Larissa, if you want to request me, uh, request to join on the bottom. Uh, that will help. I think you need to request in order for this to work. Uh, so guys, look, you're very welcome to today's live in relation to SME businesses and setting up business, uh, which is all uh, very exciting. And I think it's great if you're an SME business, um, owner or thinking of getting into business by yourself, I think it's vitally important uh, that you uh, really listen in over the next half an hour, 40 odd minutes, because it's going to add so much value to what you do from a business point of view. Um, so there is again, I think I could see you popping in there, there's a little, question, there's a little uh, camera down the end, if you press that I can uh, accept for you to be able to come in. So guys, Larissa Feeney is from Accountant Online, um, a, a really good site in relation to helping people get themselves up and running, I suppose, for the first time, um, and also being able to give them ongoing advice going forward. Um, I think uh, financial planners and accountants work really well if a relationship is there from the very beginning for both uh, themselves, but also, more importantly, for their clients, uh, which is what we're trying to bring this added uh, value for today. So, uh, let me see. Uh, let me see. Let me see. I keep accepting this. <laughs> Good old technology sometimes just doesn't work, doesn't matter what you try to do. Um, there is a have your accepted there. Um, one second. Let's see, can we walk this another way? Uh, boom, boom, boom. Sorry, but this guy's, uh, I can see the risk is, uh, accountant coming in. It's not accepting the risk is, uh, acceptance there for some reason. Right, what I'm going to have to do with Risk, if you're still there, I'm going to come out of this live and start again. I don't know what's going on, but I don't really want to do it without you. <laughs> I have all the questions here from people from earlier on. So, guys, I do apologize. Uh, it says Larissa was unable to join for some reason. Uh, let me see, I've got one more chance here. Um, Larissa. Yeah, it's not happening. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to come out of this live and go back into the. Ah, no, wait, everyone stay there. Sorry, Paul. <laughs> There is a close made it in time. <laughs> I know, I know. I, I, know, I, I was, know. I was honestly starting to slightly panic there. <laughs> Sorry, my fault, my fault. Technical issues on my side. Apologies for That's that. That's okay. <laughs> no, don't be silly. That's fine. Uh, we have a decent audience here as well. So, guys, thanks for sticking around there. Nothing worse than trying to work out technology when you're live mm -hmm. on techno when you're live on this. Uh, so, listen, thanks very much for uh, joining me. I was just saying to the guys before. I was trying to get you in about uh, accounting online, what you guys do in the background for your clients from setting up businesses to bring them right through in relation to looking after them on a weekly, yearly basis, tax returns, bit of business advice there as well. So uh, before I get into you, would you want to give a little bit more background there as well about you guys? I think that might help everybody because we've got a lot of people on this. I can see from the names, I know some of these people already that are either already set up in business or thinking about getting set up in business from the first time. So maybe let's talk about what you guys can do first, or what I can do. And I have a load of questions from people here as well. And guys, if you have any questions you want to ask us, uh, try and use the question box or the comment section uh, and we get through the questions over the next, like I said, 40 odd minutes, 45 minutes. Great. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Okay, so thank you for that. Accountant Online, as you said, we're a firm of online chartered accountants. So we help small businesses set up their either their sole trade business or their limited company business and we bring them through all of their compliance requirements so anything that you need to do to make sure your business is successful from a compliance perspective either with revenue commissioners or with companies registration office okay so we'll help we help you along all of that journey okay brilliant and then i suppose the big <laughs> the biggest worry for for people is making the tax returns i mean i know setting up is obviously difficult as well we get this question a lot here at ask paul how do i get myself set up what are the four steps so obviously you do that as well as the annual returns every year whether limited or whether a company and payroll etc so it's basically a one-stop shop exactly everything you need to do everything you need to know and everything you need to do to get yourself set up and remain compliant because there's nothing worse than getting set up and then not knowing what to do. You know, you don't want to, nobody likes to get into trouble with revenue commissioners, with a tax man or with companies, companies registration office. Actually, I think in fairness, that's a really good point you made there, Larissa, in relation to the company's registration office. I think a lot of people automatically think when they set up a business, especially a limited company, that they just leave their account to do in relation to the taxes. But obviously, if you're a limited company and you're a director or you have somebody that's a, as a, assigned as a secretary, there's an awful lot of compliance piece from the CRO point of view of the company registered offices. It's not just a tax piece that they have to worry about. I think everyone forgets that. 
Yeah, exactly. Now, for limited companies, if you're a director of a limited company or a secretary of a limited company, you have responsibilities as well. That means that you can't, um, you can outsource the function to an accountant, the same as a tax return, but you can't outsource the responsibility. It's still yeah, your so responsibility. Yeah, you have to carry responsibility, yeah, but you can get yeah. them to remind them what they need to do and sign exactly. off if they've done it, etc. Yeah, so it's like a backup plan there from a CRO point of view as well as a tax. Yeah, exactly. Important. Yeah. Look, what I got, what I got to jump into is there's a couple of questions coming in. Before I get to the questions that are coming up, because we asked our followers earlier on what questions they wanted asked. Uh, and I know it's four o'clock today, so probably people watch this back on the live later on as well, or on, on our grid later on, which is great. But one of the questions that came up was, do uh, accountants usually recommend, so not just accountant alone, but any generally accounts, do they usually recommend software to work with? So we're getting a lot of people that are saying their accountants might be old-fashioned, still pen and paper, or they're sending accounts or receipts but they know about technology that's out there. Uh, I know one or two of them, sort of accounts, Red Bull, few of them. So yep. who do you guys recommend or what way does that, what, what's the benefit for the your clients as in the SME business owner and ultimately for you and everybody in the triangle, I suppose, there? Okay. So to answer the first question, some accountants will recommend software and some won't. It really depends on the accountant. As you said, maybe more traditional type accountants won't recommend software, maybe because they're not aware of all of the software that's on the market. And there's a lot, Paul. There's yeah. a lot of software on the market. The first thing I would say is you always, today you should always go with an online software rather than an offline software. Really, yeah. you know, there's no, there's no reason why anybody would choose an offline software today. After so offline, that, you're referring to, sorry, Larissa, just for people that might be a bit like me back when it comes to software stuff. Offline, you mean the old-fashioned, get a disc, put it in, upload it once a year, is it? That's yeah, gone out exactly. with the Indians. That's oh, gone out with is. the Indians. Yeah. It is. I mean, there's so much trouble with it, backups yeah. and losing the disc and the computer and blowing the right up. And version you know, as well. Yeah. To the so that's, that's gone out. Okay, yeah, let's, let's agree that if someone sends yeah. you a disc, don't use it. Just look don't for use it, online. right? No discs anymore. Yeah. It's online. I mean, online has, okay, the, the downside of an online piece of software is you're paying a monthly fee. But you've got 24-hour access. You're never going to lose it. It's right, never going well. to get out of date, you know. So it's a no-brainer. It's an online piece of software. There's loads on the market. Now, what I would say is that all of the software will do the same thing. You know, it'll all post the transactions the way they're supposed to be posted. What it comes down to after that is the interface, whether you like it or not, you know, what you prefer. Usability and, whether, and how the you usability, use it. Well. Yes, exactly. And your particular business may have specific requirements that means that you may need a particular type of software. Okay. Now, in general, if you're a small business, generally speaking, any of them will do. We use Zero a lot, for example. You mentioned Surf. Um, you mentioned Big Red Book, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, all of those are fine. We would use Zero a lot, mainly because there's a huge amount of integrations that can plug into Zero. So no matter what okay. type of business you have, it'll work for you. Right, excellent. Okay, and then guys, for people that are watching this, uh, haven't gone Soul Train or haven't sold their own company yet, or even if you have and you're not using software, the software is basically there to track uh, your sales, your invoices, your VAT. So it makes it easy for someone like Larissa or her team to be able to go in and keep an eye on the boys, you're rather in the old fashioned way of sending all your receipts or getting stuff out of the van and getting stuff out of the drawer in the office and dropping it in once a month. Keeps you up to date, keeps it you know, on top of your business as well. So Highly recommend, um, obviously, uh, get, get some piece of software in if you're going to be uh, joining up with the guys and the count online. Obviously, Zero Drive is what they recommend and get that in place and get yourself trained on it. They're very easy to use, in fairness, what I've seen myself. They're not, uh, they're not rocket so science at all. Yeah. So easy. And I mean, as you mentioned there, you, there's, a, there's a lot of apps that you can that plug into Zero, so that you don't even have to enter information onto the system anymore. Yeah. You know, for example, you take a photo of your receipt or your invoice, it pops it straight and into it, the and system. And it takes the bat and everything from there, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. It's that easy. Yeah. Yeah. It okay. knows Very what easy. to do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay, we're going to do is get the big one out of the way. We get this all the time. And this is one of the questions that makes me feel like an accountant half time when I try to answer it. And every single Instagram live I've done over five years, and every time I mentioned SME, the question comes, when do I turn from a sole trader into a limited? And I think I've got it about 50 times on the question <laughs> box from earlier on. So let's just discuss that. So for, well, very, well, the sole trader, um, all right to say the sole trader is usually where people start off and yep. then they progress. Okay, yep. so let's let's have a chat about that, Rissi, if you don't mind. When do you start it and when do you move, more importantly? Okay, so the reason most people start as a sole trader, Paul, is because it's the easiest, less complex structure. Okay. It's easier to start up. It's easier to close down. You don't have to worry about company's registration office. You just have to worry about compliance with the tax man. So it's easier. Um, you don't have to pay for, you know, incorporation and all of that. 
And that's the main reason why. And also a lot of small businesses starting up, you're not too sure how it's going to go. So the commitment, you know, it's less as a sole trader. Okay. Now, the big question, as you rightly say, is when to change from a sole trader to a limited company. The simple answer, the most, now there's loads of reasons and I can talk about them all, but the main reason is if the money in your bank account is starting to build up, yeah. then you have to think about it. Now that's very simple. That basically means that the business is making more than what you're personally spending in your lifestyle to keep yourself and your family. Yeah. The business is making more. Therefore, you don't have to, you don't have to spend that money. So the, the, the money is building up in your bank account, which means you're making more money than you're spending, which means you're going to pay more tax than you need to. Therefore, yeah. you should look at a limited company. That's the very basic answer to that question. And I love that answer because I've heard some people in the past, to be fair, say, oh, it has to be 250 or it has to be 200. But for me, from a financial planning point of view, you're right. Because what I find a lot of people go wrong business-wise is that they end up taking too much money out of their limited company, the old limited or even their sole trader. They're paying way too much tax to let that yeah. money sit in their bank of Ireland and current account in their personal name because they're not using it. So they're building up savings where they could be building the savings in a limited company and using that yeah. way more tax efficiently. So whether it's yeah. funding an investment account through the company or buying a property through the company or funding a pension or doing something through the company, they're wasting all this money to the tax man for no reason whatsoever. For no reason. Yeah. yeah. For no I, reason. I, I so you have to be smart. Like when people say 250 or they put a threshold because it's a case by case basis. If I've got a small, if I'm single, I've no kids and I'm maybe living at home, I might only need 30 or 40 grand a year. So if I'm turning over 100 grand, it could make sense for me to go limited. Yeah. So rather than, you know, if it was somebody that was married three kids and a mortgage and they had, you know, they needed 150 or 200 grand, uh, they're, they're not making profits, no point in going limited company because they're draining all the money and paying the tax anyway. Exactly. And I see that a lot where, you know, sole traders are making decent profits and yes, the tax bills are big, but lifestyle spend is quite high as well so you're not yeah. there's no saving to go as a limited company you know yeah. it might make more sense from a timing perspective in some cases but there's no tax saving so that's a really really good rule to to or a really good thing to look at if you're considering it now there's Very a whole good. other other reasons why people might consider going limited company you know come our business limited liability etc yeah limited liability it might look better for your customers you might look bigger than you are and you want you might want to portray a certain image things like that as well you know yeah. but it's usually yeah, that tax. can be important in fairness for people as well depending on the sector in. guys just say if this uh, I know it's on a live um, we are going to be doing a webinar with the guys next week as well that webinar is on my link tree you can actually go to my link tree and register for the webinar it's next Tuesday so have do check that out because the webinar is just going to go into more uh, content you know we're going to use our, our screens a little bit more we can't do that in the live as well we give away more examples of when and what this looks like uh, okay so I think the uh, other point that came up quite a lot and this is where a lot of people get caught I think from COVID-19 which I think is great because as a financial planner we always talk about there's two ways to be successful with your money is number one make more of it or number two cut your costs okay yeah. so like a business for someone personal finance so a lot of people are talking about side hustles. Now, I know it's a very American thing. I'm a big fan of someone like Gary Vaynerchuk in the States. Uh, I think his content is brilliant. So I was talking about side hustle, side hustle. So a really good question came in here on. Hi, Paul. Can you answer this? At what point do you have to declare your side hustle and register as a business? Okay, this is a, this is a good one. A lot of people have done this. And I find even people like teachers or guards or people that have a little bit of side income from somewhere, again, through COVID-19, where they would have more time in their hands um, and I'm using teacher and guards here, by the way, not just to pick up teachers and guards and extra income, yeah, yeah. but we just yeah. get that a lot, a lot, a lot of those people that have side incomes because the way their hours work, uh, and whether it's are given drawings for teachers or whether guards are doing other work. So again, just example was. Yeah. Okay. So you're not going to like the answer to this question, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> I know the answer. <laughs> it's very simple. It's very simple. Any anything you earn over and above your salary or your your income that's declared is taxable, unfortunately. Yeah. Now, but you do get to take off expenses. walking a dog for a neighbour and getting paid, doesn't it really, technically speaking? Everything that you earn is taxable. Now, the good thing is that you can take off expenses. So it yeah. is profit, remember, not all income. So that is, that is important, especially if expenses are high. But you, you gave an example of grinds, for example. Anything like that is taxable unfortunately. So there's no free money, unfortunately. Yeah, there is no free money. So again, I think that maybe with this person was laying that what time do you clear your side hustle as a register, as a business? So yeah. maybe there's, maybe someone's declaring as an income and they want to know, well, actually, when do I turn this into a business? So I want to say to that person, in case that's what the question is, yeah. it's when you can supplement fully your income. So if you're someone on 50 grand a year 
and your side hustle is now bringing you in a grand a week. Well, now you can stop your main career as, example, teacher and then start working as an artist or professional dog walker or whatever you're doing to earn that grand a week. Uh, yeah. So you'd have to, before you fledge into that business, you want to be replacing the income. But that's why I always like when people are starting off on business by themselves for the first time. Uh, and say they are a PAY worker employee for somebody, they should always try to do the side hustle first to make sure it works, make sure they like it, make sure they're committed to putting in all the hours it takes to be successful in an SME business. Uh, but ultimately, you wouldn't give up the job until you're completely confident that you can earn at least the same amount of money uh, working yeah. for yourself. And, and you know, if, sorry, no, just, right. just before you move on, just one point on that, Tom, all right, Paul. The only thing to remember is that if you're replacing your income, you need to replace your before tax income rather than you're actually yeah. in the money yeah, every, every week yeah, for every month. Yeah. So if you're on yeah. 50 grand a year, you need to be bringing in that 50 grand or grand a week to make sure you're That's replacing it. Not your net income yeah. yet. You're bringing home two and a half grand a month. You don't want to yeah. be just replacing that because you'd be, you'd be in trouble once you start paying income tax. Well, this is it because the problem with the sole trader structure, as we know most, most businesses start like that, is let's say if I started a business today, so today is what, the 14th of June, yeah. I don't have to pay tax until the end of next year. Yeah. So like that, you know, a lot of people fall into that trap because you have to put away money from the beginning for tax. Otherwise, you yeah. get caught. I've actually said this time and time again in my lives and even on a couple of posts on my grids. The big problem that I find with people when they set up their big, their business for the first time is that they don't remember the tax. I know it sounds yeah. silly, but they don't. And like I said, so if you set up business this year in January and you're a sole trader, you trade from January to December. You're not due to pay the tax until the following October, 10 months yeah. later. But that could be, you know, 20 months after making some of that income. So yeah. what I'd always recommend to people, I'm sure you'll probably agree, is to have a second account. You have your main working account and a second bank account, like a savings account, deposit account, and put yeah. a third or, you just know, or whatever yeah. it is. Just put every time you make a sale, a third goes into that tax account. And yeah. the reason for me that's so important is that I've seen from a financial planning point of view, businesses fail. Because they get to the first year, they're doing great, they think they're doing great, then they get a wallop of a tax bill of 30 grand. Then they borrow off the bank for that 30 grand, they're trying to pay their tax go forward and pay the loan down, and they're gone. Yeah. They, they last yeah. two or three years, and it's all been because of poor cash flow management rather than not maybe having a good product or being good at business. It's just That's cash it. flow ruins the business, and you can never recover from that then once you're, no. once you're gone down that rabbit hole, it's really hard to get out of. No, it's very important. You're absolutely right. It's very important at the beginning to be fully aware of what your obligations will be. And also, don't forget preliminary tax because that's another thing that yes. trips people up. Because not only do you have to pay your tax in year one, but you have to pay it again as a payment on account for, for year two. So that can be extraordinarily expensive. A lot of sole traders starting off don't start with the big tax bills because they're building up their business. So it takes a little bit of time. I lost you there for a second. <laughs> it takes a bit of time to build up business so you can, you know, you can lead into it gently, I suppose. And yeah. you'd be very lucky if you if you had a 30,000 tax bill straight away. Okay, brilliant. Well, look, I suppose that from that point of view, cash flow, cash flow, cash flow is probably the most important thing after, obviously, your tax and your compliance, but you need all that piece in order to be, be good with your cash flow. Uh, okay, the uh, resources for learning the basic steps required to start. Now, I find, uh, I mean, I know you're going to probably have a little bit of content for people as well on your site. Uh, I find when you're doing an SME business, in my opinion, and looking at people and helping the past, um, it's just start. There's a lot of learning on the job. And I think what I'd always say to people is don't get too bogged down. Now, I know that I, I love the local enterprise office, so Leo, uh, LEO, local enterprise office. They have fantastic courses that are free uh, and they get you set up for businesses, for marketing, business plans, even a little bit about the accountant piece and the compliance of the CRO. They're really good. But there's nothing like getting advice. And I, unfortunately, and I'm not trying to say this from Larissa's point of view because I think uh, they're very competitive in what they do at Larissa's company. But I do think it's about getting people around you that are experienced because as a sole trader <coughs> or as an SME business, you end up being the HR director, the marketing manager, the accountant, the, the financial controller, the salesperson, the person that cleans the toilets, the people that write the clients. You end up being everything. So I'd always say I like the question about trying to what are the resources for the basic understanding. But um, honestly basic understanding is hire someone like, I'm not trying to give a sales pitch for Larissa here or genuine not but hire someone that knows their shit because it's going to save you time learn a mess around you're never going to master it so yeah. I think if you're thinking about getting set up just reach out get the accounts package get everything done and then just go even if it is that side hustle for a time being get to know what's going on but try not 
overthink if you're good or you think you have an entrepreneurial spirit or you think you're going to be able to do what you're doing for somebody else and make more money out of it just go do it you know get people around you that know what you're talking about because you can procrastinate here all day long and you can read a million books nothing's going to prepare you for running your own business no uh, that so is just true. dive in and get good support that is true. That is true. And we have we have a lot of webinars on a monthly basis. There's one in particular, yeah. you know, that people can sign up for a spray before you start a business and what's the best structure. And that will give you the basic questions. Um, for From a compliance perspective, yes, an accountant will help you, help keep you right. Because some businesses get into trouble for issues like that they really shouldn't get into trouble for. You know, you mentioned cash flow earlier on, maybe missing VAT return deadlines, missing um, tax return deadlines. All of that is easy to sort. If you, you know, if you, as you say, delegate the task out to somebody else who knows their stuff and they can keep you right. And all the other areas of running a business, you can learn as you go, but you need to be able to keep the business alive. Otherwise yeah. there's no business. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Affairs, that's a really, really good point. Uh, it is. You need to know all these things. But again, I think just reaching out to people is really good. Um, taking over small family business in the new year, any advice? Yeah, don't fall out with your family. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a tricky one, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Family businesses uh, are tricky. Yeah, um, it, yeah. Is. It, it is. I mean, look, for, for any any advice or points or tips, I, I think the problem is you're taking over an SME business, or take, especially if it's family, that you really want to know what you're getting into. You really want a good set of eyes on the business for So I don't know what you mean, taking over. You're working the business already or whether you're going in and never worked in the business before and taking it over. There's so many things that that could mean. But I would really encourage you to get a second set of eyes on everything that's going on in the business. You don't want to be left with liabilities, first of all, or messes or you know compliance issues that Larissa has already gone on. Um, yeah, that, that, anything else to add there, Larissa? What would you say? I would say, um, just to add to what you've said, because you're absolutely right, a second pair of eyes. Some family businesses are notoriously difficult because of all, you can imagine, all of the personalities involved. And there could be generations of history there as well. If there is, a, if it's a good business, make sure you have a good board of advisors or a good board of directors that can advise you objectively. People who are not involved in the day-to-day -day of the business, but, but who can provide you with objective advice on the issues that you're encountering. Yeah, very good. And again, as an added bonus here, honestly, try and come to an agreement that you won't fall out with your family or what's going on. Yeah, in the business honestly, seriously, family don't and fight. Businesses, I, I've, <laughs> yeah. I've seen it, it it's, it's a nightmare. So really, really, really try and promise yourselves that you're going to keep the business to the business and not let it come into, uh, let's not, let not come into the family or the business. Like, you know, I think that's really, really important. Uh, okay, can I claim mileage as a business owner and take it off my tax bill? Or do you know how that works? Let's talk about mileage allowance, really. Okay, okay. So there's two ways. If you're a sole trader and a limited company. So I'll start with the limited company, if that's okay, because that's the easier one. If you're yes. a limited company, you're a director of a limited company, you're treated like an employee. So mm. you submit your mileage claims every month, just like you would expect an employee to submit to you. You fill out a mileage claim, where the journey business, where the business journey started, where it ended, the number of kilometers, the reason for the journey, and you can get the mileage rates online at revenue.ie. The subsistence rates are on there as well. And it's a great way to get money tax-free out of the business. And every director of every business should be doing a mileage claim on a monthly basis if they incur business miles, which most of us do. Yeah. So that's the, that's the first thing. Now, if you're a sole trader, it's not possible to claim mileage, unfortunately. You have to claim the cost of the business of the cost of the of the business miles in your car. So that means that you need to, if you have a car that you own personally, and let's say for example, you own a car personally and you use it 50% for business, 50% for personal use, then you should be claiming 50% of the entire cost of running the car through the business. So that's, that's tax, tax insurance, insurance mileage, repayments, everything. Yeah, everything. Right. Everything. Okay. You should be claiming everything through the business. You just have to be reasonable in your estimations. Be very, very, like, in other words, it wouldn't make sense, Paul, if I was um, a family of six people and we had one car and I was claiming 80% business use. You know, that wouldn't make sense because yeah, it's not going to stack up. Everyone around the place, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Whereas if you were a family with maybe two cars, it would be different. So you have to be reasonable in your Everything. estimation. 
Okay, excellent. And uh, then the next one that we're on cards is come up as B I K. So a few questions in relation to B I K. Uh, again, it, it's different, isn't it, from a point of view of a commercial vehicle or a private vehicle or what you're using the car for on different limits. Uh, I, I, I'm not saying we, we'll put that into next week, but I think we might keep that for the webinar. That was a yeah. question asked because I think we should show the race. I think it's much harder trying to explain to B I K. So we might just hold that for the webinar for next week. Sure. Which, like I said, guys, be go to my link tree. You'll be able to register for the webinar. There will be a lot more content than this for next week for the webinar because it's a little bit easier to explain some of these things. Uh, suggested, suggestions for winding down a limited company uh, by my deceased father. He was the only shareholder. Okay. So, okay. So in the case where a shareholder has is deceased, yeah. then the assets will go to the estate. The estate, so there's somebody yeah. else appointed in the estate for the will. So that's more exactly. of a legal point of view. That's a legal it, point of really view. Because that's really CRO compliant, important, guys. It's not really the accounting piece. Now, the accountant might need to pop in, to have a look at the accounts and wind down the valuations, but the solicitor would really have to guide you that way in relation to making sure you, you exit that property because it's, it's yeah. illegal. And as well as that, the beneficiary does is the estate. So you need to find out who, if there was a will made or whether it's gone to probate, um, yes, yeah, so you really need a, you re really need a solicitor on that one for us. I would have thought. Yes, absolutely, and that is something to, to bear in mind and, and to maybe to get that done very quickly because the danger with the limited company is that if you miss deadlines, there can be fines and there can be audits that are necessary. And That's again, a very important point, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I've seen cases where um, companies had to be reinstated twelve years later because there was you know property within in the companies and we had to go to the high court to get the property out. So. You know, it's something that you you can easily sort out, but you just it, it does. But it's it also we don't solicitor. want to bury your head in the sand and say I'll get to it next year or later because the company and whoever's exactly. there, whoever's the, the who's now now liable is going to be uh, from the estate point of view is going to be shown to them. Okay, very good, excellent. Uh, I just got a couple of questions coming here actually. Lloyd's might try and answer them. Um, um, let's see, Where are here? These are all coming in again. Actually, one second. There's always a way. Best was right. I tried the phone. I'm at the, I'm at the duplicate. This I don't know how we. I don't mm -hmm. know how we did this. Uh, well, web noise. Uh, okay, so here's a good question. Um, best way to extract wealth, minimize tax from a sole trader business. And we've kind of answered this already that you probably need to be a limited company. Uh, yeah. if you're going to build up. Yeah, we have. Haven't we, <laughs> if, if you're, you're worried about up, extracting wealth from a sole trader business, well, then yeah, you yeah, you can. You're, all, yeah. you're already gone wrong being a sole trader because you're yeah. actually just paying a hell of a lot of income tax and all your wealth or your profit that you're building up so you're way better off going limited and housing now when it comes to that point of view the easiest way again you might just refresh the rules for me here it's three years for entrepreneurial relief you must hold the shares for three years yeah and then if you're a limited company sole trader three years and that means you can liquidate sell the company whatever it is and only pay 10 percent cgt rather than uh 33 percent and then if you're over 55 or eight years of age, you know, something like retirement relief, you will cover relief, retirement yeah. relief off in the webinar again, a little bit complicated yeah. to do it here. Uh, but yeah, entrepreneur relief is probably going to be your best mate here because only three years, doesn't make a difference yeah. what age you are, there's no limits. And you get all that wealth out at 10%. You don't have to pay corporation tax, obviously, in the mission, don't you? You have to pay corporation tax through the, through the years. Oh, we've lost you again. Oh, oh, there you are. <laughs> um, keeps falling. You've, <laughs> you have to pay your corporation tax as the company earns the money over the years but then once you once you hold it for, hold the company for a sufficient length of time and you work in the company during that time that's important yes. as well so the entrepreneur relief to, to qualify for it um, and then yes you can liquidate the company and pay 10% tax as opposed to the 33% tax so that's a no-brainer if, if you can qualify for that if you're in the company for, if you're in it for the long haul though to, to the person who asked this question if you're in it the, for the long haul in terms of a limited company structure it is probably a pension contribution, Paul. You'd be advising there, I suppose, for for wealth extraction. Yeah, exactly. With the pension, so I, I would always go entrepreneur relief. But in fairness, a lot of people don't not relieve this because I think as a financial planner, they automatically expect pension, 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 pension. But it's not always pension. Uh, in fact, you should definitely be looking to keep a little bit of wealth in your limited company and investing. You set up a corporate investment account within your limited company. And then you can use entrepreneur relief to extract that wealth out in the, in the later stage, or else entrepreneur relief may or entrepreneur relief then maybe retirement relief. You're over fifty five years of age, and then the pension. Now you're yeah. probably looking at a mixture of all things because it's very hard if you're 30, 25, 35 years of age, or even forty, whatever it is. 
and you have wealth in your business or money in your business, you don't really want to have to lock it away to 65 if you're thinking of getting out in the next few years or selling the business. Um, there's tax, pro, tax pros to everything, but it's three ways, entrepreneur relief, retirement relief, and then pension, in my opinion. Uh, but I know a lot of pension advisors there would disagree, but they would because they're selling pensions. Uh, we're yeah, looking at the yeah. overall financial plan here. Uh, why it is different. Uh, this second question kind of leads us on to this again. Uh, there's another one, you can see it there. Uh, sole trader business as a side hustle will only last six to 12 months. Any tips to do with sole trader income? So you're, you're, you're staying sole traders, you're going to have to pay your income tax, but the best thing you can do is maybe make a pension contribution for your PAYE or from this income and get a little bit of that back. So you can make a contribution against last year. Um, everyone can do that, by the way, but for, for 31st of yeah. October this year, if you're a PAYE worker or you're a sole trader, you can make a pension contribution that came back off last year's tax bill. So you're going to pay yeah. the tax being the sole trader, but the only way you can get it back is to actually put the pension plan in place there. And if the, um, the question was or oh, sole trader income for six or 12 months, wasn't that right? Yeah, um, sorry. Sole trader business on a side hustle will only last for six to 12 months. So okay. it means you wind it down. So they obviously okay. don't want to be a limited company because they're not going to have longevity. Yeah. What to do with the sole trader income? Yeah. So another option may be to make sure that it straddles over the two tax years. Say, for example, if you're not a higher rate taxpayer in one or the other year, there might be oh, yeah. savings there somewhere. To, you know, you can work it that way. That's a great idea, guys. That's a, that's a, that's a really good plan. So if you, if you have your income spread it over two years because you yeah. can up to use it 30, uh, 36,400. Yeah, 36,400 for 20%. 20%. Yeah. yeah, so if you're not going to yeah. have that in one year, spread it over two years, yeah. you get a lot more income at 20%. Um, yeah, and then yeah. that's on that point as well, for limited companies, if you do have a limited company and if you're drawing a salary, if the company can afford to pay you up to that maximum of 36,000, you should make sure you use that because once you leave, once we leave the tax year, you've lost. You can't, you can't use it back. again. Yeah, yeah. Actually, in fairness, that another another question came in in relation to how much should I pay myself uh, when I started on my sole trader. You're right. If you if you're doing really well, always make sure you're taking your thirty six to five. Yeah. Even if you don't need, if you're living at home with your parents still, and you only need twenty grand a year, if you've had a really good year, make sure you take that down take because that's twenty percent. Because you're never going to get it at twenty percent again. It's going to cost you yeah. much more money in the bridge. Okay, brilliant. A uh, question on screen. Hi, Paul. I am a sole trader, but I have a partnership in a studio. I input money from my sole trader account into the partnership. How do I mark down on my sole trader books? Oh, really good question, Larissa. Okay, so that sounds in effect like two sole traders. We have yeah. sole trader business, and then a, a, partner a partner in a partnership. Yeah. Yeah. So. That is just drawing out of one business and introducing into another business. So there is no tax deduction there, or you're not going to get you're not going to get tax relief on one or pay tax on the other because it's just really a movement from one to the other. Right, but she that this person I think is Marie, so it is she. She has to have an interest in both, obviously. Yeah. So she has to be in the partnership. Yeah, and the exactly. She's in the yeah. partnership and the sole trader, and you're drawing out of one and introducing it to the other. Yeah. You're not yeah. getting tax oh. relief on the sole trader. You're not paying tax on the on the money you're so bringing in. There's a free the movement across the both because there's an interest in the sole trader and the partnership. That's it. Okay, yeah. very good. I hope that answers your questions. Uh, and best of luck with that. Um, okay, another question that came in here. Then I have this one. One second there. There's a cancel. Uh, Bit all over place. Uh, okay, so best way to extract. Oh, so you have that one. Sorry, but this one. Uh, oh yeah, a very, a very cool question came in. Any help? It's terrifying. <laughs> so very dramatic. <laughs> oh. uh, I was expecting these standards at the end. Of that one. Do, 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 do. It is terrifying. But look, what I will say is that there's two things to SME businesses. Okay, so I started my business 10, 11 years ago. I've set up three or four businesses since, and every single one of them has been equally as terrifying. And I'm not again. I'm not just trying to say this because Larissa is on the call here on the, the, the instant live rather. You need to get people that know what they're doing to help you. Otherwise, it would be even more terrifying. There's so much stuff that you don't know. Like again, I'm in business 10 years. We've over 50 staff. We've got more flying. It's really good. We're delighted. But by God, I don't have a, 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 a an iota of the knowledge that Larissa would have when it comes to accounting and also even the CRO and keeping compliance. Because I'm an entrepreneur, I'm not supposed to know that stuff. I'm supposed to know other things about business. So please, if you think it's terrifying, take a little step back and find out what you can add to your business 
why are you going into business? Are you good at selling? Are you good at you know, with your hands? Are you good at art? Are you good at music? Like, wh why are you getting into business? Because it's not to be the accountants. Nobody sets up business because they want to be the bookkeeper. Everybody I did. Said, I did, Paul. Now I would did. you stop? You didn't. <laughs> <laughs> you were, you wanted to be an entrepreneur. That's you know, your business is way too good for someone that just wanted to be a bookkeeper. Which you know what I mean? Like, genuinely speaking, people go into business because they have a passion for something and are really good at it. They don't want to be sitting down doing accounts all day long. They want to be out meeting clients, making money, doing business. Uh, so all the stuff, I'd, I'd always say to people that settle business, but it's terrifying. Write down everything you know your business needs to do. Get a journal, write down the accounts, write down your marketing, all the stuff, and then mark down what you want to spend your time on and hire people to do the rest. And if you can outsource uh, the stuff, like obviously over to accounting online, or you can also sort of say to a HR person that's going to look after recruitment, to look after your staff contracts, and then you can outsource payroll, all the stuff that you don't want to be doing. Do that. Pass the book, get rid of it, and even if it costs you money, it's going to say, and it's going to make your job more enjoyable. Uh, yeah. I genuinely wish I had it done this years ago. Uh, when we started, we've only got on our first HR in house, uh, and we've 58 staff, like I said, and we're growing rapidly. But I wish we had a brought in EFA years ago. Uh, because I was involved in all the interviews, all the negotiations, the stuff. And it's just a nightmare. Uh, and I didn't like that side of the job. Uh, and uh, look, biggest tip is get people in, pay them, take less money for yourself than it needs to be. But yeah, get, uh, get people in and know what they're doing on the business and it'd be less terrifying. Yeah, absolutely. I echo everything that you've said. I see it all of the time. Every, anything that you can delegate in your business, you should delegate. And I mean, the basics, the basic functions of bookkeeping, for example, a lot of small business owners think that because it's simple that they can do it themselves, but yeah. actually it takes you away from selling. Yeah. And yeah. that's what you set up your business to do, which is sell. So anything that takes you away from generating revenue, you shouldn't be doing it. Yeah. Actually, you know what? You're dead right. It's taking you away from generating revenue or doing the piece of the business that you like doing. Yeah. Uh, and you're probably leaving a job you don't like to be, you know, the entrepreneur you want to be. There's no point in creating a job doing more stuff you don't like <laughs> yeah. because as the boss you get to dictate what you yeah. spend your time doing and you get to dictate who you can pay to bring in where if you're working for somebody else you can't you have to just do your job because that's what you're paid yeah. from so never lose sight of why you went into business in the first place but don't spend time doing stuff you hate doing life's too short for that especially if you own a business because that's the biggest perk of owning the business uh, okay uh, maybe get this last minute here hi Paul I started in September to, to, to uh, can't speak, sorry. Hi, Paul. It starts September 2021. Is it too late for me to buy software ref to accountants? No, you can start there. Anytime. You, want to, Anytime. you want to make sure your accountant's using that software. Obviously, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah, no, it's not too late. There'll obviously be a bit of catch up um, from September 2021 up to date, but that's fine. That's very, very doable. You're better doing it now than waiting and, and doing it later because you just have, you have to do it at some stage, you know? Yeah, you have to do it at some stage. Yeah. And yeah. for anyone that's just joined us lately and missed that, we were talking about from the very beginning how important it is to have a really good a, a payroll, or sorry, a countless software and a cheap monthly basis. Uh, it, just, it just helps you and your accountants keep an eye on your business and get your accounts out quicker, uh, which is important. Yeah. Last thing I just want to say in this, Larissa, before, just everybody again that's maybe jumping in and out here, we are doing a, a webinar next week. All the information is on my link tree. Go and register for the webinar because we have to give way more working examples. We're just using Instagram Live today to give a little bit of advice out into the marketplace. This is going to be saved for my grid if you want to watch it back later. But please do register for the webinar next week. We'll be giving way more working examples of everything that we've spoken about today. And the last thing I do want to say on this is that we got a question in relation to, uh, I'm going for a mortgage. It's true, I have to be a sole trader two years. So I thought I'd bring a bit, bit, bit of final, personal finance into this. Yeah. Yes, it's true. You need to be operating two years. But Larissa already mentions that you're wrong. If you set up business in January 2022, you don't really have to pay your accounts next October. So that means 2022, 2023, and you're not paying your accounts till the end of October 2024. So it's really nearly three years before you have visibility of your two full year sets of accounts. Now, if you're an accountant and you were using pay or accountant software, it might be quicker to get your accounts out in 2024 if you have to wait the full 10 months. Uh, but just do bear that in mind. If you are considering leaving a full time employment, you will have to wait possibly nearly two to three years before, it might be even four years, because you might have really good income in year one, or your cost will be very high in year one, given small profit. So it can take a long time to build your uh, sole trade or business, your limited company business up sufficiently 
that you have income that might be the same as your PAYE job. I think everybody forgets when you work for somebody, they cover the rates, the insurance, the building, the everything, all the costs. When you go out on your own, your sales have to cover those costs. So it can take you a little bit of while to get your business up and running, that you have enough money to take income that's equal to your PAYE. So really consider getting a financial plan in place maybe before you go out. It might be a case where you go for a mortgage a bit quicker and to get your foot on the ladder and then go out on your own. But it's just something that can be managed and can be, it can be actually managed quite well. So I just thought we'd tie that bit of, you know, sole trader advice and mortgage advice in as well. Um, for yeah. Everybody. Yeah, and we, and we can pick that up whenever we have our webinar. I think it's on the 29th of June, isn't it? Um, and also, Paul, we might also pick up, you know, the challenges around starting a business as a sole trader and yes. not paying tax because there's very little money being earned in the first couple of years. Yes. And then the implications of that on PRSI contributions, pensions, maternity benefit, and all of that. So we it's can massive... maybe go into a bit more detail of that when, when, when we have our webinar. That's a really good point for the webinar. So we pick up the webinar with that. Actually, that's really good, Arissa. That's really good for people as well. To, to, to there's a lot of things to consider here. Leaving yeah. PAY going in, you get you 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 lose a little bit of entitlement, which is important to keep an eye on. Um, yeah. well, look, guys, uh, that's it for today, Larissa. Thanks for joining me. That was brilliant. Uh, thanks, Paul. We, you've added buckets of value for people there and helped them make the right decisions going forward, which is again what it's all about here at Ask Paul. So uh, I hope everybody enjoyed that session. I know it was quick, uh, but I will be able to watch back and we'll see you all. All the information, I forget the date. You said the 29th. I thought it was next week. 29th, so. I think. 29th of June at 10.30, yeah. Great. Well, there you go. You know more than I do. So uh, <laughs> for, for more information what Larissa just said, go to my link tree uh, and you'll see the session there and you can register for the webinar and we can go from there. Right? Uh, and look forward to seeing the webinar. Thanks for joining today, guys. And Larissa, thanks for joining me. That was brilliant. Really Thanks, Paul. It. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Thank you. All the best, guys. Have bye a nice bye. day. Cheerio. Bye-bye.